Hello, uh, and welcome to Managing Microsoft Services with, with Atria. Um, I'd like to thank you all for, for coming today, and I assume everyone is joining us from their homes, which is awesome. Right, so, so today's agenda, I'll get, I'll get straight into it because we haven't got much time. Um, we're, we're quickly going to talk about how you configure Atria to manage Microsoft Online Services, and we'll go through provisioning uh, tenants, and then connecting to existing tenants. Um, now I've got some FAQs and time for Q&A at the end. So just to recap on why we're doing this, uh, there's four kind of key areas uh, where Atria helps with provision with uh, with off Microsoft um, online services. So the, the the core thing is provisioning. We we allow you to manage tenants, users, and subscriptions alongside the other services that you manage with Atria. This, um, this gives security benefits. You have uh, less need for global admin access across your staff, um, and it reduces the, the attack surface for um, customer data as well. Uh, we use the secure app model, which is a secure means of connecting to uh, and managing um, Microsoft services. The system provides delegation. This means that your, your service desk your resellers and your end customers can do things which you would normally only be able to do with um, uh, global admin access to partner center. And um, the last thing is kind of data. We, we're tracking what's going on so you can see who's made provisioning changes and you can bill at the user level um, as well. So the, another key benefit um, that we've kind of put a lot, of, a lot of effort into is removing the requirement for AD Connect in multi-tenant hosted desktop scenarios. So many um, service providers may be running hundreds of AD Connect servers, and our aim is to kind of help you um, remove that load from your, your um, infrastructure. So our assumptions um, for, for this kind of training session is that you have, um, or you will need Atria installed uh, version 12.6.6 or later. You'll have an understanding of Atria concept services and provisioning already. Um, and you will have the Azure AD and Microsoft Online service modules installed and enabled. But quickly to recap on, on Microsoft Partner Center, this is, very, this is the key um, thing that we use for actually uh, all of our automation. Um, Atria sits in the middle. There are two different types of Microsoft Partner either a direct CSP partner, that's where you get a, a bill from Microsoft and you're selling the services um, to customers, you're supporting those customers and you're billing those customers. Um, the indirect model is where you're an indirect partner and you're actually buying your licensing through an indirect CSP reseller or a distributor such as Ingram Micro or SoftCap. Um, they do your support and billing. So for tier ones, Atria can provision tenants configure subscriptions and allocate licenses. For tier two, um, your uh, provisioning of tenants and subscriptions needs to be done by your reseller, your, your, your distributor, and um, we can still allocate the licenses in the same way. So we can still manage the users and licenses in the same way, we just cannot um, do handle the tenant creation and subscriptions. So there are two core services within Atria that handle uh, the Microsoft Online service. There's the Azure AD service, which is all about controlling how the tenant is configured and the connection between Atria, and that includes the connection through to Partner Center. That service is provisioned to the customer. And um, the Microsoft Online service is dependent on the Azure AD service. So we need to provision that, provision the Azure AD service first before we can provision the Microsoft Online service. This controls um, the Microsoft licensing. So it's about how the licenses that we assign to two users. Um, so it creates the user in Azure AD and it will um, uh, assign the licenses to that user. So you provision that service to the customer and you provision it to the user. So what we'll do now is go through uh, configuration. So we're going to connect to Partner Center, then we'll go on to configuring the Azure AD service and the Microsoft Online service. So the connection we create to Partner Center is uh, something you probably only really have to do um, once or twice. Um, it, it's a process we go through to grant an application, the permissions, 
needed to actually do the automation tasks. So there are two core scripts that you need to run. I'm not going to go through these today. And there is, we've got a detailed article which steps you through what you need to do. Um, they essentially create an application, give it the permissions that you need, um, and then it generates some kind of secrets, um, secret tokens. You enter those into Atria, Atria stores those tokens away, and then from that point on, Atria can then um, talk to um, a partner center on your behalf. Um, one, once you've created a connection to Atria, one of the things you can do to check that it's working is um, retrieve um, the product catalog. This is an API call that's done through Partner Center. Um, for direct partners, we will actually go and retrieve that in real time from, um, from Microsoft via the API. Indirect partners, unfortunately, we don't have that um, capability um, to, to access the, that, that particular API call. So in that scenario, we, we just retrieve a, strat, a static product catalog from a file which we ship with the product. So the quick walkthrough I'm gonna do now is I'll flick over to Atria. Uh, um, so we're, we're gonna go in here and we'll find um, in here. So, so the partner center connections are handled through the Microsoft Online Partner Center Connections menu option. So I've got a number of these set up. You can set up multiple Partner Center connections. So um, typically for most service providers, you'll, you'll have the capability to have a production connection and a sandbox connection so that you can um, carry out test provisioning with your sandbox account without actually incurring any expenses. Um, if you operate across multiple regions, you can add one for each region. So um, you, you you can um, have one for Europe and one for the USA, for example. Um, to create a new one, you click on this link. Um, most of these details are generated by the script, so I won't go into those in a huge amount of detail. Um, give the connection a name, so it could be production, um, and then say whether it's a tier one CSP or a tier two CSP. So if you're a tier one, that's the direct Microsoft um, relationship, select this. This means that we can then, we will attempt to provision tenants and subscriptions through through this connection. If you select tier two, it will restrict those functions through the through the system. The region is quite important. Um, you need to pick the region that you're in. So the region that your partner center account is in needs to be selected here. So typically if you're in Europe, it will be Europe region and market. Um, we're in New Zealand. Um, so this gives us access to four different countries that we can um, sell subscriptions into. If if we uh, if your um, if your CSP um, partner center is set up in a different region um, to how you configure this, then you will get errors when you try and provision um, subscriptions into countries that you you are not allowed to. So um, make sure this is set up correctly, or you'll hit problems. The tenant test username is just used as a test account that we use for uh, checking password validation in Azure AD. So um, something like test.user is fine for this. And you'll see that user gets created as part of our provisioning processes for the tenant. Um, other than that, these are all generated and produced by the, um, by the scripts. So that's that. Um, I will leave, leave that for now and we'll come back to how they're configured later on. I'm just gonna go back to the PowerPoint now. Um, so um, now we're going to configure the Azure AD service. So the Azure AD services, the core thing to look at is the customer plans. And these are a template that you can use for common scenarios for tenant configuration. Um, the settings can be overridden as with any other Atria plan can be overridden at reseller or customer level to meet specific needs. So that's how you can cater for things like different regions or even partner, particular partners having their own partner center connections. So we'll quickly walk through the settings. The first one's manage ADFS. If that is checked, then Atria will then assume that this customer is federated and it will attempt to federate domains in Azure AD when we do provisioning of the tenant. Um, you can flag domains to be um, federated in the list. So you can have, have some domains federated and some that aren't. Um, it also, when this is checked, it will also um, signify that 
Atria needs to set the immutable ID on the um, Azure AD account to link it back to the Active Directory account. That's something that's normally done by Azure AD Connect, um, and we replace that, that function. Um, also, if a user is federated, then Atria will only change passwords in Active Directory. So it only needs to, that's the primary password, so it'll only do that. If it's not checked, Atria will, um, when it's provisioning accounts, it will provision the accounts into Azure AD and Active Directory separately. And when you do a reset or change password, it will do that in both Active Directory and Azure AD. The um, ADFS policy is where all of the settings that need to be set against a domain are stored. So you need to carefully set these up to match your ADFS server. Um, these are all fairly standard settings. I'm not going to go into these in any detail. Um, you can configure, if you've got multiple ADFS farms for different customers, you can configure these as needed. Um, Atria uses these settings to federate the domains. Um, there is a, um, there is a, uh, uh, I'm showing it here. So there is a, um, uh, an application, like a, a, an application, an editor for these policies. So go to Microsoft Online ADFS policies menu to get to that. Uh, the managed licenses flag. This is um, this is only really available to tier one partners. Um, so only check that if you're a tier one. Once it's true, it will it will mean that Atria is going to provision um, and create subscriptions um, on behalf of of that customer. So when you um, if it's unchecked um, for that customer, we will not attempt to manage licenses. So if you have a, a particular scenario such as a, you might have a large customer with an enterprise agreement that has licenses being supplied from a different source direct, or directly from Microsoft. You can turn um, the license provisioning off and Atria won't attempt to buy subscriptions. Um, if it's turned on, it will, so just to recap, if it's turned on it will, and you're a tier one provider, it will automatically provision subscriptions as needed. It will increment subscriptions as needed. So as more licenses are, is required, it will add them. And on a daily basis, it will attempt to remove any unassigned licenses. Uh, the Azure AD, um, sorry, the partner center, um, attribute here um, is where we just determine which uh, partner center this customer plan should use. So you can set you can set up a customer plan which is different for a region or it could be one which is just for um, uh, for your sandbox account. Um, and, and of course this can be overridden at reseller or customer level. So you can set it um, set it as a default and then you can change it for particular resellers. It can only be set by a service provider. It is not available to change by resellers or customers. So only you can do that for them. Um, the remove relationship is an important one. And by default, we leave it unchecked. Um, so what this does is when if you um, deprovision the Azure AD service from a customer, if this is checked, it will actually remove the, your relationship with that with that tenant in Azure AD. So it, it, will, it will essentially mean that you cannot actually access that um, customer. All of your permissions for that customer will, will be removed. So be careful about selecting it. it. It will remove that relationship and stop you from being able to manage them through Partner Center. Um, with, and you'll have to get that customer to give you access back again. And the last thing is the sync policy, which we're going to review in more detail later on. But this is really the configuration for the sync process, which is used to import changes from Azure AD into, into Atria. So it's it's a very important feature, um, and we come the the system comes with two um, default um, uh, policies. Um, these these can also be changed through the interface uh, from twelve point six point seven onwards. Right, so um, onto the Microsoft Online service. So this is the second part. Um, so the Microsoft Online service is um, where we configure the Microsoft products that we want to provision to the customers and their users. Each plan can have one Microsoft primary product. Um, so that's like your Office 365 E3s example we've got here. 
Um, it can have any number of add-ons selected. So when you change that product, the add-ons um, will, will change in this list as well. Um, so you can add those into the same plan um, and you can enable or disable product features. So by default, all of the features will be enabled. But if, for example, say you don't want to turn something on for a customer and this does happen, you can actually turn them off um, within the plan. Um, and you know, the, one of the key benefits here is that you can change that at the reseller and at the customer and at the, the user level. So if you need to actually have some control over some of those features, you can do that at the customer level and you don't need to worry about people having to remember to do it the right way each time. Um, now, setting up the plans um, is, you know, if you've done this before, you don't have to do it very often, but it is it is a bit clunky. Um, there's, it's worth for this because you, you may need to do quite a, quite a few of these to pl plan it out in advance and save time. We've got an article written on do, doing this. Please, please do read it and that will hopefully help you to save time and get these set up um, quickly and in the way you want. Um, also recommend assigning product SKUs to these. If you do that, then it, it will very much simplify your billing and our billing reporting will track um, track these things quite nicely if you, if you set up the SKUs um, in them. Uh, other quick things to talk about is qualifications. Microsoft call it qualifications. So tenants can be qualified as an education, a government or a non-profit at the moment. You'll notice when you pick the product in the list, underneath there is a qualifications um, highlight here and you can see that um, for E3 for example there are offers available for commercial and non-profit so it's the same product but they're delivered at a different price point and only to these tenants and um, with this qualification in tune for education for example is only education and power bi pro is only co commercial so when you when you're picking the products in the plan you are picking products when when atria comes to provisioning subscriptions it will choose the appropriate offer to use when it creates that subscription. So if, if the customer is qualified as education and you provision something which has got an education qualified product, it will use the education qualified offer to provision that product. If there isn't an offer available, Atria will default to commercial subscriptions. And there's an article on, on this here as well, which uh, is worth reading if you're dealing with education and not for profit or government. So the second walkthrough I'm going to do is really just, we're just going to provision a tenant directly from Atria and show how easy it is to set up a tenant and assign services. So I'm just going to click back to Atria and we'll go to the new customer. Um, so I'm going to create a customer called uh, Rapid Couriers. Definitely in demand at the moment. Um, so in here, um, we put the address in here. The address that is stored in here is also used for provisioning into, into Microsoft's um, partner center. Add a domain, we'll provision them, create the admin user. So, so that's the normal process. Now we're going to go into the Azure AD service. We'll pick a plan. You see, I've picked the plan here. Um, I'm going to click on the create new tenant. So this is um, uh, I create a multiple domain. I've got we've got a bit of a naming convention we use here for temporary and permanent ones. Um, so that domain's available. Um, I can check this box here to push the domain into Azure, um, and you can see the address um, and contact details are pulled through from customer. Now, if you do update them in here, it will, it's updating the same data source in Atria. So um, be, be wary of that. 
Um, you, you have to like the validation on here is quite important. So things like postcode will need to be valid for your, for whatever country you're provisioning into. Microsoft does validate some of these things and, and we just capture those, the error messages if it, if it fails. Um, so, so be, be careful with the address, make sure you um, enter the address kind of correctly. And, and if you have problems um, when, it, when it provisions, then look at the error log and there should be a clue as to why it's failed. Um, this is the customer agreement for Microsoft. Um, so if you click on here, it actually just copies the details down, but you will need to put in the correct details for whoever signed the agreement um, with Microsoft. And I'm gonna click provision. So this takes a little bit of time to, to, to actually do the provisioning. So it, it um, it's validating some information before it actually sends the request off. Then it sends, sends the request and now it's actually going to go and create the, the tenant in, um, in partner center, creates an Azure AD um, it will then, um, it will then kind of capture back the um, tenant ID and store that back against um, Atrius so that from now on, we've actually got a, a kind of a link with, with that tenant. Once this is finished, we can then go and provision the Microsoft online um, service. Um, unfortunately, I can't get into it yet uh, while it's still working, but I'll, I'll go into partner center now and we'll see if we can see the tenant appearing. Right, now it's finished. So if I go back into here, I should now be able to see it in here, in Partner Center. Sometimes it's a bit... The click off of here. For those of you that have used Partner Center before, you'll know it um, can be um, a little slow at times. Um, I want to go back to my customers list and hope that my rapid couriers customer has appeared. There we go. So, so now the tenants created in here. Um, now I can go back to provision the other service. Right. So I'm going to go to Microsoft online service now. We'll be pleased that this one's much faster. So what, what the first thing it does when it um, go when we open this, it goes to check to see what subscriptions there are in the tenant. So um, at the moment there's no subscriptions, so it's showing nothing in here. But if you've got um, tenants which have got licenses from any source, so whether they're through another provider, it will show what licenses are available. So this, this may not be um, directly related to the subscriptions you've sold them. So these are the plans that we have set up. So I'm going to turn some of these off um, and we'll go into say this E3 one and I'm going to turn off a couple of these features. So I'm going to turn off to do and staff hub. Now one annoyance in here, which is um, in line to be fixed shortly is that this override button doesn't work unless we actually check all three of them because they're kind of grouped together. So um, if you're making a change, check all three of them. Um, don't worry, we are fixing this um, in the in the next release or so. So I apply changes and provision. Now that's going to go away and um, set up those templates for licenses. So as I said, it's much quicker. Now I can go to a user and I'm going to create a user. Uh, John Smith, um, that's well. and we're going to provision him, and we go back into, we, we can only see the Microsoft Online service, the Azure AD service is not, is not for um, provision to users. So in here, by default, the Azure AD user only um, plan, which is just Azure AD user only um, is checked. And I'll go, I'm gonna go in here and give them him the E3 plan that we created before. So um, this is gonna be his um, username and this is gonna be his password. Now it's telling me here that the domain used for UPN is not verified as yours, so provisioning may fail. So what I'm gonna do now is uh, typically you'd verify your domain before you try and provision any users, but I'm gonna actually go back now and I'm gonna change John to have a UPN, which is the Microsoft UPN, which is validated. So it, it, 
the provisioning has already added that domain in so that we can now use this within the user. Um, so I'm going to go there and I'm going to go back to services, quickly go back in here, um, pick the E3 plan. Um, that's going to be his password in Azure AD and now I'm going to press provision. So this process now is going to be um, a little slow as well because what it what it needs to do is it, it's going to go and look and look in that tenant and see are there any E3 plans? It's going to say any, are there any E3 subscriptions? Um, it's, it's going to realize there aren't. It's then going to go and create a subscription which as you know can take some time. It'll wait for that subscription to, to complete and for the licenses to be available. So it's, it sits and waits for licenses to become available for assigning. Um, and then um, it will then assign a license to the user. And then once that license has been assigned, it will wait for um, Exchange Online to be provisioned correctly to that user. And then it will set the email aliases um, needed for that user. So there's quite a lot of stuff that it needs to do to get that user. And those processes are often queued and slow at the Microsoft end. So um, be patient. Um, subsequent provisioning of users will be faster because all it has to do is uh, increment the um, license. But if you are provisioning large numbers of users, we recommend you go into Office 365 and increase the license quantity on the subscription. And then your provisioning processes are much faster because it doesn't have to go and keep incrementing the subscription for each user. Um, so it, it will um, it will still do the assignment fine. Um, it will just be faster. Um, so while that's working, we'll go back to I think we'll go back to the um, PowerPoint. Save some time. We'll, we'll keep moving on. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so um, what what I'll talk about now is the, uh, another scenario, which is is quite common is um, or possibly more common is that you, you may already have existing um, uh, tenants that exist in Office 365 that aren't in, in Atria or, or for example if you've won a new customer that's already using Office 365 then you want to get them into Atria and be able to manage them. So we, we've come up with a connect tenant process. So if you can see you've got an Azure AD tenant with some users and some subscriptions um, you've, you must have their partner relationship in place. You've sent them the um, request from, from within Partner Center and they've um, connected um, to you. So you can see them in Partner Center, um, which means Atria can now see them in Partner Center. So you create the Atria customer and then um, the tenant connect process. So we search for a tenant. Um, this searches via the Partner Center API. Um, when you pick that customer, it then creates what we call a connector which is uh, it links the tenant ID of the Azure AD tenant through to the Atria customer. Um, it put, retrieves the tenant details and the domains back into the Atria customer. And um, then subsequently, uh, uh, when we run the sync process that we've written, it will retrieve all of the users and, and create users in, into the Atria customer. Um, so that, and, and it will retrieve the subscriptions as well. So the at the end result is that you have all of the users um, with provisioned with plans um, within Atria and from that point on you can then manage them within Atria, assign licenses to them and make changes to them. So the next um, next walkthrough we're going to do is, is, is the connect process where we're going to connect and synchronize an existing Office 365 tenant. So I'm going to go back to back to my script so you can see that just to recap on, on this provisioning, we've provisioned the user. I'm just going to go to Partner Center so I can see whether that user's appeared. So we can look at the customers, users, and licenses. And we've got John Smith has been created here. And he should have an E3 license assigned to him. And if I go into this, uh, if I go into this user, you can see that on his service plans, um, To Do and Staff Hub have been turned off, which are the two that I turned off. So that's that use is pretty much provisioned, and um, that customer's um, set up, which is um, a lot faster than doing it through Partner Center. Right, so the connect process, I'm gonna go through 
Um, to start with, I've got a customer who I've set up in here called Clip Packaging. Um, now, Clip have Right, so we've got this customer set up. They've got a bunch of users. These users have got varying licenses in them. And what we want to do is import them into Atria. Right, so we're going to create a new customer, clip packaging. Tomorrow I will have this set up. So we're going to set up the customer very quickly. Same process as before. Unfortunately, this isn't too. Uh, it's... Right, so this time we're going to the Azure AD service. We're going to pick the connect existing option. So if you're a tier two, that's the only option you'll have, um, but it's the same process for tier one and tier two. And we're going to search for clip. Um, that's found the tenant from partner center. And I'm going to click on provision. So we'll give it a second. Um, it'll send away, it'll do its validation, send away the request, and then it will start um, through the process of connecting that tenant back to the uh, customer with an atria. Hopefully, at some point this year. Yes. Right. So this won't be too long, hopefully. So whilst it's running, it will pull all the domains in from that customer and it will retrieve the subscriptions and any customer details, the customer agreement. Um, and when it's done, like when I go back into here now, we'll see the details that have come through from that, that tenant. So you can see that it's actually pulled the address details through from partner center um, and the, you know, the contact who signed the thing. So in here, um, this is the, the Microsoft domain. This is the domain I added, um, and it's it's here. You can see there's a kind of a, a code um, for the DNS records. So I'm going to quickly just I'm just going to press provision on that again. Then I'm going to go to the Microsoft Online service when that finishes. Right, Microsoft Online service. Um, so so here you can see the subscriptions that we've got. Within, within the tenancy. So I've got um, one exchange online plan used um, with no free units. I've got five Office 365 E1 with no free units, and I've got 12 E3s, and I've got three spare. So um, what I'm gonna do here is pick the plans I want to be available to this customer. So the Azure AD user only one is always, we're always gonna have there. I'm gonna leave these three in here. Um, and note that I don't have a plan which matches Exchange Online Plan 1. So now I'm going to provision that to the customer. So now they're all set up. They're pretty much um, imported. I, ca I can now provision new users to that customer. Um, but what I really want to do, if I go to the users at the moment, I've got no users in here other than Mr. Clip, who is my administrator. So I'm going to go to, now I want to sync the tenant through. Now there's two ways you can do it. You can do it from the Azure AD service in here. You can either do it from this menu option here, which is what I'm going to do, or you can actually do it from the Azure AD service. There's a button in there to, to do the sync. If you do it from the Azure AD service, it will actually, the link actually comes to this page and it also kicks off the sync. So um, if it's a big turn, you might not want to do that. But, um, so we'll run this one from here. Uh, this is going to take a bit of time, but you'll kind of see in a minute that um, we'll see the data start appearing. So it does a query against Azure AD, and then it's going to start retrieving the data through 
any minute now. So you can see it's now started importing users. Um, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave that running because it takes some time. We'll go back to the PowerPoint. I've got some, and I'll talk through how how that works. Um, so first thing is the linking linking user process. So um, if if you're in a situation where the tenant um, tenant exists in Atria and the Office 365 um, tenant already exists, and you'll have users that match on both sides, so the sync process will try and find um, matching users um, between the tenants. So um, in this example, we've got um, in Azure AD we've got Fred at company.com and Jim at company.com. In Atria, we've got Fred at company.com and James at company.com. So in this scenario, when the matching process goes through, it would match and link and Fred because they exist on both sides. It will match and it will create Jim on this side because Jim didn't exist and then link him. And then there was no match for James, so it will just get left as is with nothing in Azure AD. Um, for licenses and plans, the online service must be provisioned to the customer for the licenses and plans to be synchronized. Um, matching plans must be available to the tenant, which represent the license combination. So you, you also need a plan, which is uh, with the one I've got, they're called Azure AD only. And um, you need a plan with um, no licenses for kind of the situation where you've got to use just an Azure AD with no licenses. Um, now, add-ons are, note that add-ons are part of the Atria plan, so you may need more combinations of Atria plans than you than you might think. So, for example, if you had these three products, you, you might need E3, E3 plus voice, E3 plus ATP. They would all be separate plans within Atria. Um, sync policy we talked about before. Um, there is a an editor available for this now, so you can have a number of policies, but the the key settings in the policy are um, we're, we're going to talk through now. So you set it against the customer plan, and then we'll go through the properties. So you can disable the nightly sync if that's checked. Then if that's if that's checked, then it means that this this tenant will not be synced in the nightly sync each night. So if for some reason you don't want the sync to run because you're doing work on that tenant or you just don't want to sync them. You can check that box and suppress it um, either temporarily or permanently. Um, uh, the create users in Atria, that's where if, if there is no, um, if new users are detected in Azure AD, uh, it will create users in Atria, um, which will then create users in Active Directory as well. And so you can turn that off if you want to. The filter is um, the query, is part of the, the graph query that is used uh, when we talk to Azure AD to um, retrieve users. And this is the filter that's used. So by default, it'll only retrieve member users. So they're kind of users which um, are typically assigned licenses or permissions. Um, it doesn't, um, the other type of user type is um, guests. So it, it excludes guests at, at present because you probably don't want them managed within your system. Um, the master directory is something which only really applies on the initial user match. And then just to go into this in a bit more detail, if you can, if you can imagine that we've got um, a user with a user in both Atria and in Azure, and the, the city attribute is different on those users. Then, if Atria is set to master, then when when the match happens, when um, the initial connection of the user to Atria happens, it will um, pick Atria's version of the truth rather than the Azure version. Um, if if it's the other way around, Azure Azure is master, then it will pick the Azure user for, um, first. Um, so you can see that the resultant user would be um, slightly different depending on on the scenario. Now, um, note this only applies on the initial connection of the user. The subsequent subsequent syncs on on linked users are that if you've made changes to Azure AD, um, Atria will assume that those were intentional and that takes precedence. Um, and of course, any changes that you are making in Atria from this point on are saved to both locations. So it's kind of, we'll always enforce them to be um, the same when, when changed through Atria. Um, password settings, um, when, we, when we run the sync and create users in Atria, we need to set, generate a password for them. So this allows you to configure how that password is generated. So just make sure that's um, 
as complex or more com or more complex than your password policy in your Active Directory. Um, right. So the um, so now um, now I've talked a lot. We should be able to go back and hopefully the sync has finished. So I'm going to go back into here into Kit Packaging. So you can see all these users have been imported. So you can see all the users, and then at this point here, we're adding licenses to the um, to the office. It's, it's actually assigning the licenses through the Office, so the Microsoft Online service. Um, now we've had one failure in here, so you can see it highlighted here. Is that this this user here? We couldn't find a suitable match for Exchange Online. So if I go back. Um, we can see that um, that was because we didn't have a plan um, for Exchange Online, um, so hence hence we couldn't provision that user. Um, and they, they will still exist. So, so to fix that, we would need to go and create a new um, a new plan within Atria. So go to Service Deployment, go to Microsoft Online, User Plans, and I create a new user plan called um, Exchange Online. And one. I create that. Um, I'll give it an order of say 30, 25, maybe. Um, and we can apply the changes, save it there. And then we have to go and enable it in the Active Directory location. So we go back to Microsoft Online. Go to user plans, my plans here. Now I can pick in here which product I want. So I'm going to pick Exchange Online plan one. Um, you can see it's a commercial qualified plan, and we are going to apply the changes. A new feature in here that we've added is this publish option. So this means if you check this by default now, any Plans that are saved at the Azure AD level will be um, available at the root reseller. If you click on it here, it publishes it down to all sub resellers as well. So um, I know that was a bit of a pain before, so it's slightly less painful now. Um, then I save that and it should now make that plan available. I go back to my customer um, clip packaging and I should have a new plan available now that I can assign. Um, now, when, when I go, so now I've got Exchange Online Plan 1, which I can assign there. Now, the other thing I can notice here is that before we had spare licenses here. Uh, and what H has done as part of that sync process, the last thing it does is goes to look to see if there's um, an excess of licenses. And if, if there is, it then um, removes them. So there were three spare licenses on E3. It's now removed those as well. So we've now got. Um, We've only got the number of licenses that we actually need, so that should um, should save you lots of money. Right, so I've provisioned that now, and subsequently we can go back to that user, and if we want to, the quick way of fixing it is to find the user that doesn't have the plan. So if we, um, in here, and we can just pick the Exchange Online Plan 1 now and provision him. So, so that's pretty much what we were going to show today. Um, now we will go back to the PowerPoints. I've got a few more things we can talk through. Um, so, so just touching on user management, um, all the following features are all actioned across AD and Azure AD. So user updates, so anything you edit in the user page adding, removing, updating email aliases, um, provided they are kind of, if those email, if the domains of those email aliases are in Azure, it will update the past, the um, aliases in Exchange Online as well. Uh, password reset, self-password reset, change password, disable and enable account are all kind of pushed through into Azure AD or the appropriate places. So, so one thing quickly on deprovisioning, so if you're through the course of business, if you're deprovisioning a the the Microsoft Online service from a user, it will delete the user from Azure AD at that point in time, um, which is kind of as expected. So if a user leaves, you can deprovision them. If you they they will go into the um, deleted users area in Office three six five. 
if you deprovision the Microsoft Online service from the customer, it doesn't deprovision the users or the tenant. It will just break the user connection between Azure AD and Atria. So it will leave those users in place in Office 365, but it will break the user connection. Now, if you deprovision the Azure AD service at the tenant level, it doesn't delete the tenant, but it will remove the connection to Azure AD and it will suspend any partner center um, subscriptions. So if you, if you, even if you do this, um, I don't know, before, if you provision the Azure AD service and then deprovision it again before you've actually done anything with any users, it will go and suspend the subscription. So be, be careful with that. Um, and remember, it, it can also remove your partner relationship if, um, if it's been configured to do so. So they're, they're, um, they're designed so that if, if a customer leaves, you can press the button, it will suspend the subscriptions and detach you from that um, customer so that they're free to leave without you having, um, still having access to their data and um, users. Uh, so uh, question is, can you still make changes for Office 365? Um, I'd say if you can make the change through Atria, you should do it through Atria. Um, but 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 actually, you, you can make changes through Office 365. The sync will pick up any changes to users, um, you know, licenses assigned to users, and any kind of added email aliases. As you saw, you, that sync process will run nightly, and it will true things up if they have been changed in, in Azure AD. Um, if you remove, one thing is if you remove the email aliases from Office 365, at present the sync process will not remove these from the user in Atria, and that's that's intentional. Um, if the sync process isn't executed, then remember that whatever you have in Atria could potentially overwrite changes made directly in Office 365. So if you're going to change someone's address in, or their name in Office 365, Atria doesn't know about that until the sync has run. So um, if you then go into Office 365 and provision something to that user, it will potentially overwrite those changes. Uh, can you use Azure AD Connect with Atria? Um, for the tenants that we are syncing and managing, we cannot currently coexist with Azure AD Connect. Um, this is because when Azure AD Connect is configured, it will block any um, changes being made to, to users via APIs. So at present, if you have this um, requirement, then um, you can still use Atria to manage AD, and we can still we we can have a fix that kind of allows email aliases to be provisioned to AD. We are working. Uh, we've got a set of enhancements we're going to do, which will allow um, provisioning of users to be handled by Azure AD Connect and license assignment to to and control to be handled by Atria. So um, this this capability will be coming um, soon in some shape or form. Um, right, and on that point, I'd like to um, open for any questions and answers. 